Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to join us for the webinar this evening, which is being hosted by AHDB Beef and Lamb. I'm Chloe McKee and I'm the Knowledge Transfer Officer for Beef and Lamb within HDB. I'm delighted to bring you tonight's webinar on the impact of liver fluke, looking at surveillance, detection methods and treatment. Our presenters this evening are Leslie Stubbings, Independent Sheep Consultant, and Philip Skews, Principal Scientist at Morden Research Institute in Edinburgh, leading fluke research. So the plan of action this evening is that Leslie and Philip will take you through a 30 minute presentation and then there will be some time for questions at the end. You will all be muted throughout the webinar, but if anyone would like to ask a question or at any time throughout the presentation, if you think of a question, then please type it into the box on the right hand side of your screen. You may need to click the arrow in the little orange box to open this questions box up if you can't see it. When the presentation has finished, I can then ask these questions for you. So we've got over 160 people registered tonight, so hopefully we won't encounter any technical difficulties, but please bear with us if there are any. So I'll now hand over to Leslie and Philip for this evening's webinar. Thank you, Chloe, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Leslie Stubbings, and I'm, I'll hand over to Phil. Um, I'll do the introduction this evening. Um, now, I think with liver fluke, the important thing is that we have to realise that every year, every season is different. Um, individual farms are different, and even within farms, individual fields. So in order to be able to combat that and fight fluke, we've really got to understand how to risk assess and how to use the tools we've got available to monitor um, the need for um, management actions and for treatment. And of course, in this day and age as well, it's very important when we start talking about treatments that we look at using them um, in an optimal way and that we're not overusing what is really quite um, a very narrow spectrum of um, products that we've got available and, and Phil will go through those. So I'm going to start off with a bit of background and then we'll look at the diseases and some symptoms and then we'll, I'll hand over to Phil who's going to talk about um, diagnostics and, and monitoring tools. So the first thing then is Liver fluke. A little bit of a little bit of reminder, probably, because I'm sure most people have heard some of this before. But it's really important that we really try to understand our enemy and know our enemy. So it's a highly pathogenic flatworm pa parasite, Fasciola hepatica. And the important thing about this is that it's got a complicated life cycle, a life cycle, lifestyle, life cycle involving tiny intermediate mud snails. And in this picture, you can just see one of those little characters in there tiny little black snails um, and the important thing to remember there is that they are called mud snails for a reason they like muddy areas rather than really wet areas so sometimes when we have a very wet year like um the year before last we might have a very very wet year then Sometimes the snails will get washed away and actually they're not in the areas where we might expect them where it's been wet historically, but they might be in muddy areas surrounding or on the outskirts. So very important we understand that. They're a threat to sheep and cattle of all ages and also any wildlife reservoir and, and things like horses will get liver fluke. And of course, you know, there are cases where human beings can get liver fluke um, if they go eating a contaminated watercress. So really any, um, uh, mammalian host is going to be able to get liver fluke. And importantly, of course, significant environmental component to the disease risk. So the climatic conditions, the grazing management, um, how much rainfall, when the rainfall has been, and increasingly sometimes now with individual farms, they find that they haven't had a problem before, but maybe you're grazing a different area, maybe you've gone into an environmental scheme which has meant that you've got some wetter areas because that's what's required within the environmental scheme. And of course, we have to remember that that could be a really good habitat for the mud snail. So, just again, a reminder about the typical life cycle. Um, this is really important that we understand the basics of this because it's understanding the basics of the life cycle that allow us to choose the right treatments when we do need to treat, but also, as, as Phil will talk about a little bit later, understanding how we use the monitoring and diagnostic tools available to us. Because if we use the wrong tool at the wrong time, we might get not get the answer um, that's going to give us a the best option in terms of what to do. So starting off where we are roughly now in the autumn, heading towards the winter, at this stage, what's happening is 
that the snails have done their bit, we'll come back to that in a minute, but the actual cicaria and the, the intermediate life stages of the liver fluke have gone on to the grazing, they've actually gone into what we call this metacicaria, so if you like the infectious stage, where they're then in ingested by sheep or cattle, um, and then what happens is, once they get into the, to the sheep or, or, or whatever the host is, they go into the gut and then en masse they migrate, they head for the liver. Now, if the animal ingests a lot of these fluke all at once in a very short space of time, that can be pretty disastrous, as we'll see in a minute, for the liver, and particularly for something like a sheep, which basically has a much smaller liver than a beast. Um, and that's why we see acute disease where we have high levels of fluke in the autumn and winter. Now, just going back a step, though, what happens in the summer is really important and it's very pertinent to this year because when the um, little fluke start to hatch out of the eggs and they then enter the snail, of course the snails need wet conditions. So if it's a very dry, what we call this transmission stage during the summer months, then there aren't so many snails and we don't get so many liver fluke. But if it's very wet, and in some areas of the country, obviously, June, July were, and early August were very wet, that's when we see the life cycle really taking off uh, and we get a lot of metasicaria. And just to mention in the spring, here we've got, once we um, get the immatures going into um, the the sheep or the host takes about 10 to 12 weeks before the eggs are produced and then eggs start to come out and those adult fluke will sit there producing eggs quite merrily unless we come along and treat to kill them. And this is why you will hear us recommending in the um, spring, early summer um, that you to do a treatment or maybe do a treatment at housing to kill adult fluke because of course that's going to be the source of infection for our snails if the snails get the right condition in the summer. It's really important that we think about that in the round. So the, the fluke risk for this season, uh, on the left-hand side of this slide, we've got the Nardis um, forecast, which was published just a few days ago. And we can see that Scotland and right down the west side of England and into um, the northern part of Wales is being uh, built as a high risk area. And that's because they've had very high levels of rainfall. And we would expect to see fluke in those areas. The rest of the country, with the exception of Northern Ireland, at the moment is showing up as being low risk. And what you've got to be really careful of in these circumstances is that whilst as a whole those areas are low risk, we already know that starting to see some cases in Area 8, for example, and in Area 2, just last week, Ben Strugnell, who you can see on the, on the slide there, reported his first case of acute um, liver fluke and death on um, post-mortem showing that death was due to acute liver fluke. So just be very careful. It's a very good indicator of the level of risk overall. But remember that everything that we've talked about so far about the fluke, it is a very much an individual farm, an individual field even risk that we have to understand. So Acute liver fluke in sheep, this is um, one of Phil's slides, and this is what a liver, fluke, liver looks like if it's had acute fluke, it's absolutely shot to pieces. And as we said, that's because there are so many of these immature fluke um, heading up there from the, um, from the gut into the liver and literally destroying it. And of course, that's when we see um, sudden deaths, and it's very important at this time of year, if there's any risk at all, you feel there's any risk, that you really do um, investigate any sudden deaths in sheep because um, there will be no warning and it could be acute fluke. In cattle, it's different. Basically, as I've said before, basically the beast has a bigger liver. And so the acute fluke um, deaths tend not to be a problem. It's more chronic. And you can see in this liver um, the really calcified damage that's in that beast's liver, um, which will be more of an insidious chronic type of disease. So looking out for clinical signs then, obviously we've got sudden death and we've just mentioned that. Please investigate um, fall and stop because um, that could be a cause. Um, in the picture there, we've got one, this is a recumbent animal, so severe abdominal pain in the sheep. I mean, that sheep looks as though it's in real trouble, could have a liver rupture, but they're unable to, or unwilling to move. 
Moving on, as the disease gets a little bit more chronic, we can see bottle jaw um, and blood feeding of the parasite will also produce what you can see in the second picture there, which is anemia in, in, in sheep particularly. Now, just be aware, though, that, that those symptoms are also common with the, the um, infection with the worm Hemonchus contortus. So it's very important that if you start to see any of those, that you do speak to your vet and do have a look to see what is actually going on. Because obviously, if it is Hemonchus contortus and not fluke, then the actions um, may well be quite different. And in cattle, again, as we've said, generally in cattle, what we see is ill thrift and poor performance, weight loss, body condition, rather than um, deaths. And in fact, we tend to think in terms of sheep as being, if you like, the sentinel for liver fluke, because it does affect them much more dramatically than it does for cattle. But equally, where we've got mixed cattle and, and, and sheep grazing, if the sheep um, are at risk to liver fluke, then you must also consider that your cattle will be too. Now, I'm gonna hand over to Phil to talk about diagnostics. Thanks very much, Leslie. Hopefully that's been a, a seamless transition uh, to the diagnostic slide. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, Leslie, typically a hard act to follow, but I'll try and pick up on diagnosing fluke in, in the live animal. I mean, Leslie mentioned the clinical signs, and that's very important that we, we recognize those and look out for those. But we have a number of diagnostic options available to us. Um, each has its pros and cons. Uh, and each tells us something different about the fluke challenge. And, and the big three, to me anyway, would be the serum ELISA. So that's a blood test. Um, it, by definition, is an, it's invasive. So it does require the vet to take the sample. But it is the earliest indicator of fluke infection that we have. Uh, animals will seroconvert or go positive within two to four weeks of infection. Um, they can stay positive for several months, um, even after successful treatment. So that's something to bear in mind in older animals, but the blood test is really useful uh, as an indicator of infection in young animals, and especially first season uh, grazers, because the only fluke infection they can have seen is this year, and they'll give us an indication as to when they've seen that. Um, a very good alternative to the blood test um, is the Copro antigen ELISA. That's a relatively recent addition to our diagnostic uh, armory. Um, it picks up on a secretion in feces, so it's a fecal sample. This isn't blood, even though it's, a, it's an ELISA test, it's a, 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 an immunological test, but it's feces we're looking at, so it's non-invasive, so relatively easy samples to, to collect. Um, it can detect infection a few weeks before the eggs appear. Leslie mentioned that it takes 10 to 12 weeks for eggs to appear, and there's some evidence that the copper antigen can pick up infection a little bit earlier than that. Um, Good thing is it's specific for liver fluke. It doesn't cross-react with rumen fluke, which some of you might have heard about. Um, it doesn't work particularly well as a composite, sort of as a pool sample, and I, I could try and explain later if somebody wants to know why. Um, so we, we, we've parked that for now, but it is a very good indicator of treatment outcome, a very rapid indicator, uh, and has become the default choice for resistance testing. And I'll explain a little bit about that in a minute. But still, by far and away, the most commonly used test would be the faecal egg count. So we're looking for these, these uh, little gold liver fluke eggs and faecal samples. Uh, it's quite an easy test to do. It can be done on composites and individual animals. Again, it's non-invasive, so it's the same sample as I mentioned for copper antigen. Uh, but it can only detect adult or patent infection. So these are the flukes that, are, as Leslie said, are 10 to 12 weeks old or older. Um, so it doesn't detect a mature fluke, so that's a bit of a problem. Uh, it can detect liver fluke and rumen fluke eggs because they, they both come out in, in, the, in the, the method that we use. We, we sediment eggs in water and they, they, they both come out if they're there. Um, but typically fluke, just try to complicate things, eggs are shed sporadically. So you can get false negatives and false positives with, with egg counts. So you can look at, a, at animals one day and they're positive, the next day they're negative. And it's something to bear in mind. Uh, that it comes and goes just by virtue of where they live. They're in the bile ducts and gallbladder, and the eggs can, can appear a bit sporadically. So it's important to look at enough animals uh, over a sufficient period of time to get a good idea of what's happening. Um, it does work quite well as a composite test. Um, there's a composite faecal egg count method for sheep and for cattle published, and there's also a composite faecal egg count reduction test for testing triclobendazole resistance in sheep. So uh, 
as I say, each of these methods has has their their merits, um, and it's important to think about what part of the life cycle that they're telling us about. So the blood test is telling us about this early infection with the immatures. The copper antigen is this sort of uh, middle age fluke as they, as they come through. We're starting to pick up secretions and feces, and then as they establish as adults. But but just before we leave this slide, I, mean, it's, I think it is as Leslie said, it's very important to investigate sudden deaths. It's also important to look at postmortems for acute fluke because even if animals are going through to the abattoir, the the guys on the line just don't have time to look for immature acute fluke. It's it does need to be looked for properly at postmortem. So it's just something to bear in mind at, at this time of year. So if we, if we just move on to think about what other options we might have, and this is where I'm testing to see if Leslie's still awake, because she's going to knock the slide forward for me. Aren't you, Leslie? No, I am. <laughs> Thank you. I am, if it'll work. Come on. Oh, oh sorry. It's all right. It's OK. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we're still there. So thank you. Uh, so in terms of, of um, farm management options, um, there there are a number of things farmers can do that are practically then and every little helps. It's a typical sort of parasite control integrated approach. Uh, one option is fencing. It doesn't have to be permanent, but it, the idea being, and if you think back to the life cycle and this time of year, animals picking up cysts off grass, where where are they going to pick those up? Are there fluky areas or snail habitats on the farm? And the idea is to keep them out of there, at least for the, the high risk periods. Uh, a second option, which also helps, is, is drainage uh, to try and sort of make the farm or the field as sort of as hostile for the snails as possible. So to try and dry that up as much as you can. Um, but again, as Leslie picked up on, there are some agri-environment schemes that, that would actually promote the opposite, so you're actually getting retention of wet areas or introduction of wet areas. So it's important to, to sort of work around that. But drainage can help, and even rolling poached areas and, and, and leaky water troughs and things that can set up these little temporary habitats for the snails can, can really help. Um, housing is, is certainly an option as well, and a lot of cattle farmers will do that by default. Um, but we're hearing increasingly that sheep farmers are doing it too, and in, in really fluky areas. There is some benefit in that, and, and putting animals onto onto slats is a, is a new thing. Uh, it seems to be animals seem to like it, and it's it's relatively easy management, and it takes them out of harm's way uh, if the if the winter and the autumn is particularly bad. But by far and away, what most people do, as we as we all know, is is to treat, and that can be more or less successful depending on what's used and when and why. Um, so if, if we just look ahead to the next slide, which is just to touch on flucicides. And what, what options we have for control. Um, so as a group, this very much represents frontline fluke control. Most farmers would admit that this is the sort of the first thing that they, they think about. And the image on the right looks like there's a lot of choice, but there might be lots of different products, but there aren't that many actives to choose from, the actual chemicals that are in these. And, and they're made by lots of different companies. And it can get a little confusing for farmers as to what's uh, in the bottle rather than what's on the bottle. So I think that that's important too, to understand the products that are available and what they're supposed to do. And as far as I know, um, and maybe people in the audience know better, but there are, I'm not aware of any new products, any new fluke drugs in the pipeline that, um, that would be interested to know if there were any, because uh, farmers often ask, uh, when's the next flucicide coming along? But if we look at the options that we, we currently have, and it's a table a, a little bit like the diagnostic uh, options and, and again I always refer you back to the life cycle and the time of year and, and what's likely to be happening. If, if we start at the bottom actually and um, look at triclobendazole, it's a, it's a very famous drug, uh, it was very good flucicide. Um, it, so the competition sort of blew away the competition when it came out uh, because it had very very high kill rate uh, against most stages of fluke in, in the definitive host in sheep and cattle. So it can it can kill in quite quite early within one or two days with sheep and one or two weeks with cattle depending on the formulation. Um, I should just say at this point that this this table is actually uh, relates to sheep products, and I'm very grateful to Professor Diana Williams at the University of Liverpool and Cows Group for for providing this for me. Um, it's 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 very it's the latest and most accurate information about the efficacy of the different products, and and yeah, so triclobendazole has been a bit of a victim of its own success. Um, Following in a close second, actually, is, is a product called Clozantel. Uh, 
um, which can kill flukes in from around four to five weeks of age or just slightly earlier. So it has a bit of a head start on the next lot of chemicals that follow. And nitroxanol is another, which comes in again, killing in around seven, eight weeks of age. Um, and then you get two products like albendazole and oxyclozenide, which really only kill a real efficacy against the adults. So you can see, Dan has very kindly given me an optimum time of year to consider using these. So triclobendazole would be the product of choice with susceptible populations in, in the autumn. Clozantel also the autumn. Nitroxanol maybe later, slightly later in the autumn, but then you get into oxyclozenide and albendazole, which are adulticides that really only kill adults. Um, there's one asterisk at Clozantil there, for a product that has recently been imported in from, from Ireland, that's rifoxamide, which is chemically related to Clozantil, but we didn't include it in the table because it's not widely available yet. But um, and, and also to make the point that there are some other options and some other formulations for cattle, with Clorsalon being a, a, a different product that's used but kills only, only adults. So if we move on from there, just a few points to, to ponder and to remember about flucicides is that although they're in their nice boxes on the previous slide, they often end up at the back of the shed uh, with their labels missing and not always sure what's in the bottle. But to, just to reiterate the point that most flugicides don't kill all stages, um, triclobendazole can when it's working. Um, just to mention combination fluke and worm products, that there are a number out there and they're very convenient and we understand that. Uh, just, a, just a note of caution about the timing of when you might be wanting to treat for worms and as opposed to when you might be wanting to treat for fluke. Uh, so we would uh, ideally use fluke products for fluke and worm products for worms and that's that's kind of been the mantra. Um, also fluke drugs are not persistent um, even in combination with wormer components that are and that, that does confuse farmers. I've had farmers ask but uh, I've used a persistent fluke aside unfortunately. Uh, there, there's no such thing at the moment um, and also there's a constant risk of reinfection if animals continue grazing outside even after treatment. Um, again, there's no persistency in the, in the products used. Um, flugicides for dairy cattle, um, unfortunately we haven't the time to go into this this evening, but it is, it is quite complicated and a bit of a moving, uh, moving target and always consult the, the veterinary medicines directorate for the latest information on that because there's a increasingly zero tolerance for any uh, flugicide residues in, in, in milk and milk products. So farmers often ask, well, just tell me what to use and when. But again, unfortunately, there's no such thing as a blueprint for this. You have to kind of think to the life cycle, the spectrum of activity of the product you might be considering, the resistance status, uh, and the history of your farm and various other things. So if you do treat, it has to be the right product to do the right job in the right animals at the right time, given the right way. And I know that all sounds very simplistic, but uh, all those things can really help, all the R's that you can think of. And finally, the, just, just to, before I hand back to Leslie, a few notes about uh, flugicide resistance uh, in the next slide. Uh, I'm trying to get it to work and it's I'm sorry about this. Come on. No sweary yeah. word. <laughs> uh, yeah. There you go. That's it. Thank you. Oh, no, that's the same slide no. again. It's, 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 number one. it's gone. Oh, I think we're, we're missing a slide. Okay. Um, you know, if you. Just pause the thought of uh, just, just mentioning flugicide resistance. Uh, we only have resistance to triclobendazole so far in the UK, and uh, that's bad enough, and I hope we can keep it that way, that it doesn't extend to any of the other products. There aren't that many studies on resistance because they're quite logistically difficult to do. We don't do surveillance as such, but resistance has been reported in England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. Resistance to other flucicides has been reported elsewhere in other countries, like Spain and Sweden, albendazole and clozantel. Um, but that usually they, they've got a slightly different efficacy, and it's just they haven't worked optimally. Uh, but there have been reports of resistance to those. Um, and in terms of testing for flucicide efficacy or or looking for resistance, if that's the way you want to put it. Uh, the test that's routinely used would be the faecal egg count reduction test. So that's a, t a test on the day of treatment and a, a, a faecal egg count, and again, 21 days later. And that three week period is to allow uh, any eggs to filter out of the system. Uh, ideally, you'd have a big reduction in egg count uh, three weeks post-treatment. Um, a more high refined version of that is now in use, and that's the copper antigen reduction test. I mentioned that earlier. That gives a very clear indication and quite quickly too, but we still prefer to go to three weeks to make sure that everything stacks up. 
Um, so it's again day zero and day 21 post-treatment. Um, and as with all these things, we need to consider the spectrum of activity of the flucoside you're looking at, the time of year, the whereabouts in the life cycle are we as to what these products are likely to, to do and how well they're likely to work. So I think at that point, I might try to hand back to Leslie and hope that this slide is, is active. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Sorry about that. That's, uh, that one's gone missing. OK, so um, just a couple of slides from me. Um, well, the first one is to talk about um, treating incoming animals uh, and effective quarantine, um, because obviously with liver fluke, the same applies as with any parasites. You are vulnerable when you are bringing um, animals onto the farm or bringing them back perhaps from, uh, from grazing away. So the first important thing is to, to understand uh, the fluke status of your farm and where the animals are coming from if you can. If you don't, then I think you have to assume that there could be a risk associated with those animals. Um, so also asking the question, are you treating these animals when they come in quarantine for their own benefit or to protect your farm? So in this context, what we're saying is that if you have a farm and you have no history of liver fluke at all, let's say, for example, um, some of my clients now in eastern England, where we've no history of, of fluke at all, but we're bringing in ewe lambs from the north of England, where obviously there is a high risk of liver fluke, then really what we're trying to do is to treat the animals for their own benefit um, and make sure they're not carrying liver fluke into the winter. But if, on the other hand, you were bringing them in and you knew you had a liver fluke habitat, as well as treating the animals for their own benefit, you're trying to protect your farm. Um, because whether you have fluke or not, you might have habitat, you might have taken on areas where there's a habitat, or you might also be thinking about just trying to avoid bringing resistant liver fluke in those animals to, um, to get into your own um, pop population. So you need to stop and just have a think about where do I fit into that um, risk profile? Again, as well, consider the time of year and the spectrum of activity of the flucocytes use, used. So as Phil was explaining, historically, um, triclobenzol, shown there as TCBZ, the, um, the abbreviation for it, would have been the drug of choice. But because we are now seeing so much more resistance to C TCBZ, it may well be um, that what you need to do is to perhaps use Clazantol and may possibly even um, swap then to nitroxanol six weeks later, or some people would use two lots of Clazantol. But remember, if you do move away from triclobendazole, you do need to do two treatments because clearly the others don't kill immatures down to two days in sheep as TCBZ would do. If you use TCBZ, then as Phil has described, you would test to make sure it's worked, to make sure that they, there wasn't resistance there. So there's a few things to consider here. Um, the other thing as well is that, you know, particularly with cattle, because with cattle the disease tends not to be, we don't tend to see acute, um, but treatment at or around housing tends to be one of the options that's particularly pertinent for cattle and does present, prevent them from shedding eggs on turnout. So, one or two things there to think about, about incoming animals and I'm thinking about quarantine. And from the point of view of sheep and cattle, there are some um, important similarities and some important dis differences. Um, the first one is that un unlike um, gastrointestinal nematodes, genes as we call them, um, it is the same parasite this time. With, with worms, they are different. With liver fluke, as we've said before, they are the same. Um, and so when you're co-grazing, you do need to make, make sure that you look at both um, species. Less evidence of clinical disease in cattle, but as we saw, it can still have a significant um, impact on production. And, and Phil mentioned dairy cows. Obviously, with dairy cows, with you know this extra test that you have is a bulk tank milk elisa. Um, which I know a lot of dairy farmers would use now just to make sure that they've not got this um, loss of production through um, an undiagnosed liver fluke situation. We do have the same drugs, so the same actives are present for cattle and sheep. As Phil pointed out, they don't necessarily always kill down to the same um, maturity of fluke. Triclobendazole will go down to two days in sheep. It's only two weeks in cattle. But we've also got 
um, different application methods. So within cattle, we've got porons, and we do need to be very careful that they are applied properly um, and always with everything at the right dose rate. And as I've already mentioned, that we've got to consider the risk of co-grazing. Um, people sometimes like co-grazing from a worm point of view. Obviously, that does actually have an effect by reducing the worm challenge. But where we've got fluke treatment pro to, fluke to consider, then we have to um, think about it slightly differently. Phil, I think I'm going to hand back to you now. Okay, that worked. That worked very well this time. Um, yeah, just in terms of again practical fluke control uh, in and around management and treatment. Um, this idea of the four point plan was kind of came came up from um, a think tank from the. British cattle vets and, and the sheep vet society trying to simplify and rationalize what can be a complicated uh, process into, into sort of four clear, timely, uh, you know, a, a thought process aimed around the sort of life cycle and the time of the year. So spring, summer, autumn, winter and different things to think about. And in spring, it would be around pasture protection. So trying not to let the snails get infected in the first place. and, and the, a treatment before turnout, an effective treatment with an adulticide will, will take should take care of that. Coming into the summer, we need to think about reducing the snail population, and we've mentioned drainage, topping rushes, improving poached areas, fixing leaky water uh, troughs, um, because as we said, the snails operate on quite small and temporary uh, habitats and, and, and can really thrive if, if you let them. Um, in the autumn, it's about this avoiding high cyst challenge of grazing animals away from known or suspected risk areas, uh, so it's important to know where animals are picking up infection, so that's where the monitoring really helps. And then in wintertime, strategic treatment of at-risk animals, and it's, the, it's all the R's that we could think of treating the right animals at the right time with the right product. Um, and if we just move on to sort of best practice advice, I think we're very lucky in the UK to have the scops and cows groups um, who spend time carefully crafting um, useful practical information based on the latest science um, and the websites are, are pretty comprehensive um, and, and, some, and, and very nicely sort of illustrated to try and make uh, complicated stories seem relatively straightforward. I'd also recommend the Animal Health Ireland. They have some very interesting uh, news sheets and fact sheets around uh, fluke and worms and, and yonies and all sorts of other diseases. But uh, scops and cows increasingly work together, especially on fluke, because it is the same parasite in both, and uh, we don't want to be passing on mixed messages. So we, we try to keep up to speed and uh, and communicate uh, in a collective way. Um, and uh, hopefully there's an animation. So yeah, we even we at Morden also produce bits and pieces of information. And here's the our, our fluke and uh, in sheep and cattle news sheet, and there will be news sheets on other topics. And um, this is really going to test the system here. We've just produced an animation, and hopefully it does seem to work. Um, you might even get some sounds. Lurking within these animals and on the ground could be a nasty parasite. The liver fluke is a parasitic flatworm that can cause significant disease and production losses in grazing animals. That's great, Leslie. I think we could probably stop that before we get too carried away. But the idea there is to simplify again and, and make it an interesting and uh, informative and hopefully entertaining way to describe the fluke life cycle and the treatment options and the diagnostic options. So that's available on the Morden website, but also I think Scops and Cows host it and it's on YouTube um, and, and various other places. Um, I think AHDB host it as well because they partly sponsored it. Um, so yeah, so just to finish up on, on what we might call good or best practice advice around sustainable fluke control, and I, uh, Leslie or I could both take this one, but I think these messages hopefully have come across already, but the idea would be to risk assess the individual farm, to understand the life cycle, to understand what snail habitat looks like, to, to be aware of the impact of the weather. Is it a normal year? Is it, is it normally wet this time of year? Is it exceptionally wet? What was last year like? Um, and it's also knowing the fluke status of your farm. Um, so knowing that you have fluke or you, that you don't um, test, don't guess. There are a number of tests and they're all worth doing. They all tell us something. Also knowing which products work and which don't. Uh, don't wait until you've got a problem to find out. Um, that's unfortunately has happened in the past. Again, test and don't guess. Uh, but make use of all available information, the, the websites we mentioned. Um, 
but but be aware that every farm is different and as Leslie said at the outset as is every year even every uh, field can be different so it's just about knowing and risk assessing and, and making informed decisions uh, around that so I think that's that's where I'd like to leave it for this evening um, we're happy to try and answer any questions but I'll leave it to, to Chloe or Leslie to, to sign off officially but thanks for for listening and thanks for for calling in Thanks very much both. Um, so while I'm waiting for some questions to come in, I'd just like to remind everyone that the presentation has been recorded, so it will be available on the AHDB YouTube channels if you'd like to re revisit those. Um, resources on liver fluke, as Philip's mentioned, can be found on the Scops and Cows websites, and AHDB also have the manual controlling worms and liver fluke in cattle, and also minimising car carcass losses guide, which looks at levels of fluke seen at the abattoir and the costs of this, so that's quite interesting too. So we've got a few questions. Um, so the first question is, what is the cost of the ELISA test? How many samples per flock or group are needed and how long does it take to get results back? I could try to that one less unless you want to jump in but uh, do, do you know does that mean the copper antigen ELISA or the blood test? It, we could maybe try and mention both. Um, yeah, the blood test as, as I understand it is about seven to ten pounds per sample um, and you can't make composites out of blood tests unfortunately so it has to be at the individual animal level. So uh, I know SAC here and BioBest and various other organizations offer that commercially. So I think you need to check with whoever the provider is as to how many samples they would require, but it'll be somewhere between six and 12 to get a, a sort of a feel for, for, for the test. The copper antigen would be something similar, although it's a more expensive test. It's, I think it's around somewhere between 12 and 15 pounds per sample. Um, the fecal egg count test is cheaper um, and the composite version of that is cheaper still. Um, but you may have to wait a week or two to get results back from the blood tests and, and the, the uh, copper antigen. Unless Leslie knows differently, things might be a wee bit different in England. Uh, no, I think you've got a better access in Scotland than, than we have. But I think the important thing about the blood test is that what you are looking for there are obviously antibodies to the fluke. And, and, and what it can do, as Philip was saying, is it will pick up um, infection, I think, about four weeks post the animal first coming across liver fluke. So it's a really early indication, isn't it, Phil, of what's happening. So um, it's really important if you're going to use that, that, that you pick the animals that you use it in. So what we would normally recommend is that you took this season's lambs um, because they won't have had any chance to meet liver fluke other than from this season. So, so and I know, Phil, you've been doing this in our guide. We use them as what we call sentinels so that they give us the really earliest possible heads up on a farm as to whether or not fluke is active this season. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. and, and, and once, they, once you're positive, you're positive, and, and there's no point in keeping repeating that, um, but it is really the earliest indication. Um, and I know I've got a lot of people in more marginal fluky areas where this is really important that they do this so that we get a heads up as to whether they're in the firing line. Yeah, but it was, yeah, it's worth mentioning our the Argyle study minutes on a limited number of sentinel farms, as, you, as exactly as you said. But to some extent, Argyle is the sentinel for fluke in Scotland because it's very wet and mild over there. Um, and the, 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 what we, the findings we've got already this year would just illustrate what the different tests tell us, because some of the animals we've tested have been antibody positive, but none of them are positive yet with the faecal egg count or the copper antigen. So the fluke are they're there, but they're Im they're immature, and it's only when they get to six or seven weeks of age or six or seven weeks of infection will they should start to convert, and we should start to see them in the fetal test. So that we're following that with interest. Yeah, and I think I think the guys, um, Scots and cows, we we have a group of people you've seen the map who get together on the phone every uh, every six weeks or so over the winter. Um, we did that last week, and 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 Phil, that would be borne out with that that we're seeing some acute fluke disease, we're getting some positive blood tests, but at the moment we're not seeing much by way of what's in the faeces. Um, mm -hmm. So it just underlines the importance. Thanks both. Um, and following on from that, the same person's just asked, would the same guidelines apply to suckled calves as to lambs? Yes, if first season grazers, yes. It mm -hmm. just depends on their grazing management, yes. Young animals, for exactly the reasons Leslie stipulated. Mm 
I, th I think we would normally recommend if you've got a choice though to use lambs because it's it's more likely to show up I think um, Phil might like to comment but for the reasons that we've said as well that you know that they're, they're, they're probably better sentinels but suckle calves would be second, mm -hmm. the next one. Yeah. Thank you um, and the next question is how do you stop the snails from getting infected? Yeah that's a good question. Um, <laughs> Biology being biology, if, if eggs are being shed into snail habitat and conditions are right, then the life cycle is designed uh, for that to be successful. So we need to try and keep the eggs away from where the snails are. So a, a treatment at housing or around turnout to prevent animals going on to pasture shedding eggs is, is the key point there. Um, there's, I mean, there's no other way to do it. I mean, we're very limited in what we can do in terms of controlling the snails. In fact, yeah, drainage would probably be the only thing we can do. Gone are the days when we could treat pasture with molluscicides to kill the snail, so there weren't any snails present. Uh, so it, we have to assume there'll be snails present, and it's all around the time of year. What are the snails doing? Are they waking up after the winter? You don't want animals going out shedding eggs at that stage. Those eggs will hatch, and as Leslie eloquently described, we'll get into the snails and set up infection for this year um, or subsequent years. So it, it's really about making sure animals are not shedding when the snails are about um, or animals are not present where the snails are. Uh, easier said than done. I'll be the first to admit that. Yeah, it, 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 it's a real difficult one, isn't it? Um, I mean, the, the only other thing I would add to that is that sometimes there are things that you can do by excluding the animals from the areas where the snails are. So, you know, um, muddy patches around water troughs or leaking water troughs and that sort of thing, you know, that's a very practical thing. But there, you know, there's the odd thing that, that you can do that maybe just to try and keep the animals and the snails um, so they're not, um, they're not together. Thanks both. Um, and somebody's put here, I still don't understand how quickly a change in temperature will affect the life cycle of the snail. So, for example, when the weather turns cold below 10 degrees, how long are you safe for, even if the temperature then rises? Yeah, that's hmm. a good question too. Um, yeah, the 10, 10 degrees, I mean, nothing in biology is black and white, but 10 degrees is an accepted kind of threshold for when things stop happening. Uh, so it depends for how, how long the ambient temperature stays at 10 or below, because even if the snails are infected, everything goes into suspended animation at that point. So it really depends how long that period is for. Uh, unfortunately, I, I would never say you're particularly safe because we have evidence of eggs surviving over winter and, and snails surviving over winter. So biology being biology, there'll be exceptions. Um, but the thinking is that under 10 degrees, most things slow down to an extent that it isn't contributing as much as, as it would normally. When the temperature picks up, the life cycle speeds up um, and everything happens quicker. And um, that's what drives the, the forecast. And that's what drives fluke on the ground to a large extent. Um, but yeah, it's very hard to say when you're absolutely safe with fluke, I, I, don't, I never say never. I think, uh, yeah, I think, I think this is one of the things that's caught people out um, in, in high challenge years, you know, in, in recent years, is that, you know, we tend to think, you know, the, the old mantra was, well, if we've treated in the autumn, we don't need to do anything again until late winter or spring. Unfortunately, now, you know, these fluke are still very active, Phil, aren't they? And, and we can see acute disease going right the way through the winter. So I, I think, you know, as Phil says, we've got to be very careful by, by, by how we interpret it, there's no telling what's really safe. Thank yeah, you. Much, um, much milder winters now as well, sorry, I should have maybe said that, but that allows a little, the longer grazing season allows the snails to survive, allows them to shed earlier than we might anticipate. And then, then if you're not looking with the right monitoring tools, you won't see that in the animals until it's too late. Um, but it's just a bit of a moving target with, with climatic conditions changing. Um, the life cycle will will move with the times and adapt to to, to that and exploit that. Sorry, Chloe. Thanks, both. Um, and then somebody said here, um, will there be other products available to stop the overuse of clasantol? So specifically, this person's thinking of a flucicide from Ireland. The name begins with R. Um, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, probably <laughs> get that one, Phil. <laughs> yep. 
And they took an Irishman here. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll take over from the Irishman for this one, shall I? Um, yeah, well, if they're talking about rifoxanoid, um, and there's, there's been lots and lots of discussion, um, and scops and cows actually have been in discussion with the VMD about this because we were very concerned um, that rifoxanoid was being um, um, described to people as something which was new and different. Um, I wish it was, but unfortunately it isn't. It's been around a long while um, and it is very, very closely related to Clazantal and there are documented cases of cross resistance. So um, if you've got resistance to one, you get resistance to the other because the chemical structure is very, very similar. Um, so unfortunately, rifoxanide really has to be viewed as um, really another Clazantal. Um, and to use it to think you're sparing Clazantal could actually cause more problems um, than it actually solves. So it will be harder now um, for that to be imported. It's not impossible um, to get an import license, but it will be harder to do that. And that's really to protect Clazantal. I don't know whether Phil wants to add something to that. No, I think that's that's the state of play as we understand it. There's historical evidence from Australia of cross selection um, using rifoxanide and producing clozantel resistant isolates and that's just a worry if that happened in the field um, so it has to be as you say treated as another clozantel so it's not a, a break from clozantel it's a, a member of the same family and that's how resistances come about if the mode of action and the mechanism of resistance is the same um, you, you can get selection across resistance so it's, it's just a worry um, about judicious use, um, so using products that are different chemicals is better. So nitroxanol is a different chemical to to clozantel and rifoxanide, so it has its place. A uh, slightly different spectrum of activity, but a totally different chemical. So uh, limited choice, but we have to be very strategic about what we do. Thank you. Um, so we've got a question here about abattoir feedback. So if you sent a group of 25 finished cattle, for example, and one came back with liver fluke, would you treat the remaining an animals or monitor them and see what fluke problems you have, even if that is next spring? Are you taking that one, Phil? Uh, that's quite a difficult one to answer, actually. Um, yeah. um, I would, I'd be tempted to, to, to monitor and, and you know, because you're only going to see the chronic infection at the abattoir, so that suggests there's there are only there are adults there. But yes, I think that's quite a challenging one to know what's what's the treatment decision or what's the management decision based on one positive. Yeah, um, it would certainly indicate that there's fluke there. That might be a surprise to you uh, to the producer, or maybe it isn't. Um, so I think it's just being on top of monitoring and understanding what stages are going through and 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 how bad is the damage. Is it historic? Is it recent? Is it active? Um, so I think it's important to know all of those things and have as much uh, information as, as as you can to hand. Um, yeah, it's always a bit difficult when you get sort of one positive. Does that just trigger a, a whole tranche of treatments? Um, and we're always trying to be very careful around tre treating all the time. Um, but it's it's about treating at the right time and using the right product based on evidence. Um, certainly, I would be a bit concerned about abattoir feedback, but I would be looking at monitoring as well uh, to, to, to sort of fill in the gaps. I don't know if you want to add anything, Leslie. Well, I think yeah. I mean, I think one out of a group like that, my first question would be: the cynic in me would want to know: is it definitely fluke? Um, because obviously, you saw that cattle liver that we had on the dem on the um, presentation, and it may be that there's liver damage due to other things. Um, that's going on. Um, yeah, no, I don't. My knee-jerk reaction wouldn't be to treat. It was, as Phil says, would be to go in and do a bit more monitoring on the basis that you know, are the animals doing well? Is are the cattle actually generally doing well? Um, and use the other indicators rather than pile in and, and treat. It's actually surprising when you look at sort of production data for for fluke at the abattoir. Um, the, the flu, quite fluky animals can be can be quite productive. It's just that they they can take longer to get to the abattoir, um, and they maybe all present as as looking kind of similar when they get there. But historically, they would tend to be older. So there is a hit on their on their production, as you say, that you, the farmer may not necessarily see. So it's important to to bear in mind, you know, what age is the animal, what 
weight gain, how is it doing in production wise? And that might give you an indication that all is not well and that fluke is the problem. Um, but yeah, I would be looking to to sort of complete the gaps in the diagnosis to be absolutely sure. Thanks both. Um, somebody said here that they've got suckler cows and calves on broadland marshes. It was very dry and obviously now it's very wet and we've got flooding. Um, if we have another few weeks grazing, how will this affect the risk of infection? Another few weeks of rain, is that the question? Uh, another few weeks of grazing. Another few weeks of grazing. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to know. Is that, sort of, is that salt marsh or is that normal grazing? I'm not familiar with the um, just, we've there. just got broadland marshes, um, marshes yeah. that are flooded is all I've got. <laughs> um, I mean, there's always a risk with animals grazing outside. I mean, if, if it's proper salt marsh, I think that risk is lower because the, the, as we understand it, the sort of marginal areas like that don't particularly support the life cycle. The snails don't like that kind of habitat um, in our experience, but every situation is different. And, need to look at that uh, whoever whoever's asked the question needs to be aware of that of the habitat and the history and is there fluke there or are there snails there so it's just those bits of the jigsaw that we talked about um but if, yeah if fluke's already there another three or four weeks grazing could increase the chances especially if the weather stays mild and wet like it is um, unless it gets really wet and flooded like leslie says we sometimes can get snails washed away and reduced risk but yeah, each scenario kind of needs to be treated on its own, on its own merits. Um, but if it's salt marsh, I think there's some evidence that that's less of a risk than sort of marginal grazing. Thank you. Um, so in animals that are grazing outside during the risk period, how often would you recommend treatment, assuming there is a history of fluke on farm, given the lack of persistency from the drugs? <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Yeah, again, it's a difficult one, isn't it, Phil? Because I mean, there is no persistency. So as soon as you treat the animals, if you put them back on an area with a high challenge, they will immediately start to pick those fluke back up again. So when we get into those circumstances, you know, there's a lot of pressure then on the um, uh, the treatments that we're using, and we've really got to start thinking in terms of can we actually move those animals away from that level of challenge because you know they, they are picking them up and they're picking up vast quantities very quickly and when it's sheep you know we, we can see acute disease hitting them again very quickly but i think one one point is maybe we have to kind of reset the clock when animals start grazing again and it's easy to think that uh, you know if you treat with say clozantil which can kill from six, well four to six weeks of age and older you think well that's them covered but once animals go grazing again, you're back to day zero. So there's another four weeks worth we need to be aware of. Uh, if triclobenzol is working, maybe then that's less of a problem for you. But it depends on yeah, the spectrum of activity of the active you're using and the time of year as well. I mean, it can be, depending on the time of year, uh, the risk could be less uh, from, from immatures if it was, say, springtime. But this time of year, it's very much the immatures we're worried about. And, and you have to kind of reset the clock every time animals go back out after treatment. I, mean, I think it'd be fair to say that in some really high risk areas, Phil, we have we are reaching a stage where you know housing is one of those um, management actions which the risk of fluke is driving the need to house. Yeah, exactly. That's what we're hearing. Yep. Thanks, both. Um, are rivers and streams high risk areas, or is it more standing water? Um, it goes back to the, the moving water argument that the snails are very, very small and will get moved around in, in streams and rivers. So you won't find them in the water. That, and as Leslie said at the outset, they are they're mud snails rather than pond snails. So they like, um, as the clues in the name, they don't particularly like standing water as such. It's poached areas where the ground is, is broken up with sort of open muddy patches with algae growing. That's what they feed on. So it's those, and they're not too disturbed. It's not in heavy traffic. Um, so they're, they're temporary little areas that are, are wet. And I mean, they might collectively cover quite an area, but the individual habitat is quite small and can, can be temporary. Um, so I would say there's less risk. There may be risk to somebody else, but maybe not from your snails because they've flushed down the, down the river system to somebody else's farm. Um, so there could be a risk of 
snails coming in and we've seen that in parts of Scotland actually in, in, in the west where we've had resistance appear on a farm where the farmer hadn't used a particular product and it turned out that it most likely came in from resistance on a farm upstream that snails had come in with infected they were infected with resistant fluke and that set up an infection on this farm so there is that risk as well so what you know it swings and roundabouts you might gain some and lose some but yeah rivers and streams per se are not a risk as such but water features are thank you um, and can you treat pasture for fluke um <laughs> this is fun. Uh, i have seen fantastic photographs back in the day in the 50s and 60s uh, of people with gas masks on and uh, large packs on their backs spreading copper sulfate and various other nasty chemicals clouds of the stuff um, and it worked very well um, and there were some commercial molluscicides available for for pasture land but unfortunately due to environmental constraints we're no longer allowed to do that because the chemicals are just too toxic and too broad spectrum and off target that they kill earthworms and fish and well, useful invertebrates so uh, it's just something that's come with the times that the environmental yeah case is such that we can't we can't do that anymore um so yeah but you're absolutely right snails are pivotal if we could control the snails better we might have some some chance of reducing the risk yeah, the, the only thing we can do is to try to reduce the areas that animals graze that um, is suitable snail habitat. Thank you. Um, and are lambs grazing forage crops as at risk as if they were on pasture? Well, I think if they're grazing forage crops, then then you know by inference, then probably that's their areas obviously that have had um, some degree of tillage and they've had um, forage crops sown, and so hopefully they won't be be um, as much contact with snail areas, um, but if in those forage crops there are um, areas on the around the edge of the field, or where there's the water trough, or where they're going to drink, and there's poached areas where uh, Phil was that Phil was talking about, then there's still going to be a risk of, of liver fluke. The actual forage crop really doesn't come into it; it comes back to um, the habitat for the snail, and the snails being infected with liver fluke, and whether or not the lambs have got access to that. Yeah, I think on balance, yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Leslie. I think the risk would be on balance maybe lower overall in the sense that the crop is a, is maybe better drained, the ground's drier under the crop, and also because just the physical nature of them, cyst and the snails and the cysts don't get onto the crops in the same way as they do onto grass. It's done and it, it happens in water films, and that's that's the perfect scenario. But it would be these marginal areas where there's a bit of traffic and a bit of poaching, a bit of mud. Um, and a little and little puddles and things that that's possibly more of a risk, but it's not as much of a risk as a completely fluky field would be. Thanks, both. I've just got a couple of questions left. If we're all right, just to try and try and whiz through them. Um, somebody's asked, what predators does the mud, mud snail have, and can we encourage them? And following on from that, we've got another one of, would a flock of resident geese be worth man considering? <laughs> <laughs> There are there are some there has been some discussion around biological control of the snails, um, although I haven't seen any evidence of it working particularly well. Um, and they do have their own natural predators. There are even some natural nematodes and, and parasites that live in snails. And I, yeah, I think it would be an interesting experiment to to do. You need to be able to keep the snails alive to test them to prove that you can kill them. But that's another story. Um, so in the theory, yes, there may be some biological control options and every little helps. And I'm maybe segueing on to the, the, the bird question. I mean, as I understand it, geese prefer to eat grass. Uh, ducks might pick up a few of the snails and will will eat them. Um, and there's some evidence that they can re reduce the numbers of snails uh, on, on pasture. But the, the caveat to that is there's also equally good evidence that they can spread the snails around on their feet and as they fly um, so it's again swings and roundabouts you might lose some but gain others so it's yeah i think at the minute it's an interesting hypothesis but there's no real proof that it would work um but there's even been talk of there is yeah, see if i can pronounce it um diatom aceous earth which is kind of a siliceous 
sort of pr preparation that can be put onto pasture. I've heard people do this in the States. Um, and it's it's basically like shards of glass. And when the snails are grazing themselves, it, it destroys them from the inside out. Um, so there's been some talk of that, having some molluscicidal activity. But the worry, again, would be how, how off target could that be? Because there are you know useful things like earthworms and and ladybirds and various other things in that environment. So we just have to be a wee bit careful there too. But I, d I don't know of anybody really experimenting on that, but it's an interesting suggestion. Yeah, it is. And it's, you know, the, the fungal, we've had some work that's been done in the past looking at um, fungal um, control methods for, for um, nematodes. Um, and that's showed some promise, but I don't think there's anybody actually working on it, Phil, at the moment. Um, and the dichromatic, dichromatic earth, Again, there's some talk about that with nematodes as well, but um, not aware of any uh, really active work on that. So we need to try and encourage somebody to fund a project on that. Yeah. So I don't have to the, the, bio, the biological control is, is something that um, is very interesting, isn't it? Because um, as we look at uh, the chemical control methods and the fact that, you know, as you said, it looks like we've got a lot when you see the shelves, but actually we haven't got that many actives. Um, it is something that um, probably you are going to have to look at in the future. Yeah. That was a very good question. Thanks, both. Just got a couple more and then we'll be done. So I do apologise to those of you who haven't managed to answer your questions tonight. Um, so would putting in water troughs be better than drinking from natural sources? Uh, but, well, I mean, if the natural sources are going to be muddy and poached around um, and you can the water troughs, you can keep dry and not have any leaks, then I would say, yes, you are limiting the chances of there being a habitat available for the snails. Would agree, yes. Yeah, great, thanks. And the very last one, um, this person's experienced fluke for the first time last year and they were sold Clisantal. Um They saw no improvement and four weeks later, horrible deterioration. Then they used a triclobendazole, which had an obvious effect. Um, and now the weather has changed and uh, with a devastating effect in the ewes and they're too scared to use anything other than triclobendazole. Um, I just find it all a bit confusing. Have you got any? Any advice? Yeah, that's um, only uh, until not to have had some activity because it's a very, very effective flucoside. We don't have any resistance issues in with respect. To, I don't want to suggest that it was administered incorrectly, but it, it might be something to look at and also to maybe do some testing around treatment. So you're testing on the day of treatment and testing three weeks later just to see is is the treatment you apply working. Um, I think that that would certainly help, um, whether it's triclobendazole or Plosantil. And if if this person is new to the fluke uh, story, I, I mean, I hope that you can keep fluke at bay. But um, there's a possibility that, that triclobendazole should still work, um, but that may not be the case, depending on the source of the animals or the the farm you've inherited or bought. Um, so it's a, again, it's come back, it comes back to this make use of all available information um, and testing around treatment is very important to make sure any treatment given worked. I don't know if Leslie's got something to, to add. Sorry, I was having, I was having a, a quiet cough then. Um, yeah, I think the other thing is as well, though, with Clazantil, of course, um, it doesn't kill down to, uh, so, so, sorry, it doesn't kill down to such immature fluke. So mm. it might have been a situation where the sheep had taken in a massive amount, a very, very immature fluke, um, and which the triclobendazole would get to and the Clazantil wouldn't. True. That's true. If that's, that's one possibility, isn't it, yeah. Bill? That's true. Absolutely. Choking here. Um, yeah, you know, so uh, again, you've got to really be um, looking at your own circumstances and um, mm -hmm. not, not lose faith, really. Um, yeah. But that, that could be a possibility if they've taken in a massive number yeah. of immigrants. Absolutely. Thank you both. Um, yeah, so thank you very much, Leslie and Philip. I appreciate we have just gone over there. Really appreciate you getting everyone's questions in. Um, so thank you for that great presentation and thank you to everyone at home for listening. And we've had some really good discussion tonight. Um, and I'd like to remind you that the presentation has been recorded and it will be available on the YouTube channels with previous webinars should you want to revisit everything. So thanks again and have a good evening, everybody. Thank, thank you. you.